do to change your brain. And there's really nothing wrong with our brains in respect to any other area. It's just the way we process alcohol. And if we were able, if we weren't alcoholics, we could just say, oops, that alcohol is bad. I believe I will drink it. The bill has introduced us and there is a solution to what he's going to be talking about all the way up until we get to the third step. The big problem is not in our brain, it's in our mind. And the mind and the brain are different things. My mind is my attitudes, my beliefs, my outlook on life, my opinions. And I've been trying to use my mind to fix my brain. Now the two bad news, two parts of bad news there. One is the mind can't change the brain. The way they explained it in Odessa, it may be a little bit crude, but my sponsor said, if you believe you can use your thinking to change uh, the physical nature of your brain, go down to the dollar store, or buy a box of x wax and eat it and see if you can think yourself away from going to the bathroom. Now, I know that's a crappy illustration, but it worked for me. <laughs> and he says here on the page 30, he finally gets us to that point. Gary, you've got to concede to your innermost self that you're an alcoholic, that you're powerless. This is the first step in recovery. The delusion or the illusion that I'm going to be like other people, like my brother with respect to alcohol, has got to be smashed. There's never going to be a time when you can safely drink alcohol. And he goes into page 31 of giving many of those examples I gave earlier, you know, and, and I love this. In many of the meetings I go to, we read 30 and 31 instead of how it works. And I like that reading all the way through ad infinitum, you know, because almost any alcoholic can identify with all those methods that we've tried. And then he introduces us next to that, and I'm going to go through page 32, Harold, before I turn it over to you. All through this chapter, for me, Bill is introducing me to two huge problems that alcoholics have about our minds, about our errant thinking. If you recall, I said there were two things wrong with trying to use my mind to fix my brain. One is that it can't work. And the other is the only person I'm listening to is me. I heard it said early on, using my mind to change my mind is like asking my wife's boyfriend to give me help with the marriage. I'm going to get some suggestions, but they're probably not going to be very helpful. When I'm the only one I'm listening to, I'm going to the place where the problem is, looking for the solution. And one of the things I've discovered since I've been here, folks, the solution is never found in the problem. It doesn't matter what the problem is. The solution is never found within the problem. It's always uh, found outside the problem. It leads me in a different direction. But one of the problems that people like me have, he's going to talk about on 31 and 32, and He'll only have two things that he's going to talk about for me in the rest of this chapter. And one of those is I have to understand that this alcoholism, as I have it, is not a temporary illness. It's chronic. If you've got it, you've got it. And once you've got it, it's always going to be there. The brain is never going to change. It's chronic. I will always be an alcoholic. 
I just get the option now to determine if I'm going to be a drinking alcoholic or an alcoholic who is recovered from a hopeless state of mind and body and who's not drinking. But all of us have suffered from that idea that after a period of not drinking, well, I'll control it better now. Uh, I came into Alcoholics Anonymous in 1988 for the first time. A series of really bad breaks in my life. Uh, other people not acting right. My mother had been killed by a drunk driver about four months before that. I used that as an excuse for years that that made my life fall apart. My life was nowhere near together when that happened. I just used it as an excuse. But I came to an AA meeting because I got wind from the secretary that the only job I'd been able to have in the last four years, they were getting ready to fire me because they smelled alcohol on me at work. And so I took myself to an AA meeting. And I don't know how you folks first entered AA, but I loved it. From the, I went to Duncanville, Texas. It was a big group. Man, they welcomed me in. Everybody patted me on the back, gave me a seat, gave me a book, told me everything was going to be okay. They had dances. They had parties. They had the same women there that I was meeting in the bar, and it was a lot cheaper in AA than it was in the bar. And I liked the people. And I got four months of not drinking. Now, if you're an alcoholic like I am, and like Bill is starting to introduce us to now, and the rest of the story is going to be about the unmanageability, the second part of, of step one, that I'm not only powerless over alcohol when I drink it, I'm powerless over alcohol when I'm not drinking. Step one does not mean I can't drink. Step one means I'm going to drink. And they began to introduce me to the idea that sobriety is really my problem. I'm a guy that can't stand being sober. And I had four months, and that is in a fantastic AA group. I got a sponsor. Uh, I will tell you now, he didn't have much of a sponsee. Uh, he was not overburdened with phone calls. He was not overburdened with uh, giving away a lot of his time going through this book with me. He was willing, but I just didn't need it. I was in a meeting on a Sunday morning. 11 o'clock meeting, big meeting in Duncanville, Texas. And in the middle of that meeting, I had, I guess, the alcoholic moment of clarity. I looked around the room and I said, these people really are talking about not ever, ever, ever again drinking. It's like it took me four months to catch on. They're talking about permanent sobriety. And I didn't want that. I didn't come into AA to... to for permanent sobriety, I came in to, I guess, to fade the heat, and I enjoyed it, but after four months, if you're an alcoholic of my type, and you're not doing any kind of recovery program, you're not in the steps, you're not doing any surrendering, all you're doing is going to meetings, and sharing in meetings, and listening in meetings, but not taking any of the action of recovery that's in this book. If you're like I am, after about four months, the color really starts to go out of life. People really start to get on my last nerve. Everybody in traffic is driving poorly. Those people at work are not appreciating me. I don't seem to have any more money and the bill collectors are still on my butt. The children and I are not getting along. It all the color goes out of life, and I don't know it at that time. But if you're new here, what I found out later was I can't stand being sober. 
24 hours a day, seven days a week, 30 days a month, 12 months out of the year. Sobriety is untenable because I don't have any way to manage these emotions that come up in me. You are going to later call them resentments, self-pity, fears, remorse and guilt over things that I've done to them, and anger about the things they've done to me. And I'm going to discover later on that's one of the greatest gifts that this program offers an alcoholic of my type. Y'all gave me a way to take all of the two thems out of my life. I can't stay sober if I've got any two thems left. And you also gave me a way to take the two me's out of my life. Because I can't be sober if I'm a victim. I'm believing that they're doing that to me. I don't care if it's the government, politics, an ex, a current. I can't live with two me's and two them. And out of my own experience, and Harold, I've just got two more things and I'll give it to you. Do you know if you're new here, there's no place in our book where it says don't drink. But there are a couple of places in the book, and there's one in the 12 and 12 that's pretty explicit, where they say, go drink. If you're not convinced that you don't have any control over alcohol, step over to the nearest bar, try a little controlled drinking. Now, I experienced that. I left that meeting on that Sunday morning. It was Sunday, Texas is one of those really backward states where the liquor stores are not open on Sunday. I was a whiskey drinker. So I went and bought a six pack of, of beer because as everybody knows, beer really isn't drinking. You know, uh, that's what my mind says. Now, my mind says there's a difference between beer and wine and tequila. My brain doesn't know the difference. My brain knows it's alcohol. But I drank that six pack of beer and I waited for to start foaming at the mouth or something that was going to send me right away out having to get some more. And it didn't happen. And I remember in a conscious thought of like, man, that was close. I was nearly one of them. And that night I was in a Friday's, back when Friday's used to be a pretty good little bar in Dallas down on Lemon Avenue, blowing every bit of cash I had. And then, of course, in the bar, I could find some liquor. And by Thursday, I was fired. And it's going to be, in my case, six years and a month and about 14 days before I get brought into a meeting again. Because I had not accepted the idea that I was powerless over alcohol and what it did to me once I started drinking it. That idea had not been smashed. And he introduces us to a second idea that happens to us when we're not drinking. This is when we're not drinking. That after a period of time, I will have regained control. He talks about that on page 32 of the book. Uh, a man of 30 was doing a great deal of spree drinking. Very nervous in the morning after drinking. And he quieted himself with a, another drink or two. A little hair of the dog. But he was a pretty bright guy. I suffered from being a very bright guy most of my life. 
<laughs> no, I, I emphasize suffered from that. He made the determination that he wasn't going to get anywhere in life. He certainly wasn't, wasn't going to succeed if he kept drinking. So what did he do? Now hear this. He made up his mind. that he wasn't going to drink another drop. He remained bone dry for 25 years, retired at the age of 55. And then this is what Bill was trying to point out. He fell victim to a belief which practically every alcoholic, I don't need a dictionary for the word every, every alcoholic has that his long period of sobriety and, here's the good word, his self-discipline had qualified him to drink like other men. In two months, he was in a hospital, puzzled, humiliated. He tried to regulate his drinking for a while, making several trips to the hospital in the meantime, then gathering all of his forces. He attempted to stop altogether and found he could not. Every means of solving his problem, which money could buy, was at his disposal. Every attempt failed. Though a robust man at retirement, he went to pieces quickly and was dead within four years. Folks, Bill's going to repeat that story at least two other places that I know in the book. He's already told us at this point in time that on our, or getting ready to tell us on our unaided willpower, we're just helpless. And then he's going to drive home this point again because he's making in these first uh, four chapters, he's making three points that he's going to sum up again in something we read every meeting. We end how it works with. Here's the points that he's trying to sum up and he's using this man to make one of them. We were probably alcoholic and could not manage our own life. And he's going to give us this illustration as I know it and, and Harold may know of others, but just loosely, four different times he gives us specific illustrations of we're probably alcoholic and can't manage our own life. Second one, probably no human power could. Here's the guy with all the money in the world, with everything at his disposal, every reason for not drinking. Probably no human power could. And he's gently and firmly, but with just huge exclamation points leading us to God could and would if sought. But keep in mind, if you're new, alcoholism is chronic. It's progressive. How many times in meetings have you heard people say, you stop for five years and you pick up again. You don't pick up brand new again. You pick up like you had been drinking every day for those five years. It's progressing physically even when I'm not drinking. Harold? Thank you, Gary, for kicking us off. Appreciate it. Merry Christmas, everybody. If we don't get a chance to say that before we're done, then I want to definitely say that to everybody. I hope you have a, a joyous holiday season despite COVID-19 and despite, you know, restrictions and limitations that we'll have. Uh, and I know my wife and I will be doing a uh, Zoom Christmas with our kids from around the country and uh, different places because of all the challenges that it, that it, it, it uh, brings forth to uh, get us together. So it'll be a different type of Christmas, but we're still going to have one all together, you know, and so it's, it's going to move on and we're going to be joyous and we're going to make the best of it. So, but I know a lot of people have, it's been a heck of a year. 
see pot, people walk around with their eyes crossed and, and, and their chin down. It's, what's up? 2020. <laughs> That's about all you got to say. It's just 2020. And everybody go, I, I feel you. You know, it's just been that kind of year. So if you've really had a hard one, I'm glad you're on this, uh, on this call with us today. And uh, there's a lot of hope um, to be had and uh, no doubt about it. And if you're new to AA and, and you're uh, just trying to put some days together or you're, you're just, you've been around here a long time and you're just trying to get recommitted to this thing. You, you've uh, went out and uh, drank again and now you're back. Wherever you're at on your journey, we're just glad you're here. And we just want to partner with you and help you take the next steps, whatever that looks like, whatever we can do to help you that, that's what we want to do. Uh, my sobriety date's April 7th, 1987. Uh, my home group out here in St. Louis. I'm, I'm in Hillsboro, about 30 minutes from St. Louis, downtown. My home group's in St. Louis City. It's called AA on the Rocks. Meets on Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock at Tower Grove and Magnolia at Tower Grove Baptist Church. Uh, but we're out like everybody, a lot of people are because of COVID-19. So, uh, but that's where I am on Wednesday nights. Uh, and that's where I plant a flag and that's my home group. My sponsor Steve L out of Nashville, and uh, and I, I I always tell you those things because those those are things that make a big difference in how my life has turned out. So I just want to lift those things up and and uh, and and make sure we highlight those things. Uh, appreciate Gary kicking us off into the chapter more about alcoholism. Um, this this first page, page thirty, is a page that we should all just tear out of our books and and staple it to. The refrigerator or, or magnetically put it on the refrigerator um, because it's something that we need to see on a regular basis because it's 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 really the, the it's it's the hardest part of, of this thing called alcoholism you know we spent bill spent 60 something pages to get us to this page and here we're going to spend a bunch more pages still trying to unpack what is alcoholism all about I mean we spent we spent a great deal of time already talking about it but we're going to spend some more of a time to get a a, a text that's 164 pages long and we, and we spend well over a third of it talking about you know the problem the statement of the problem and why well this this page really lifts it up and, and uh, this page really helped me to understand the malady this illness of alcoholism that we have in a way that i know for a long time today i didn't really understand it and uh but over over time because they're great you know our communicators and, and just great elder statesmen and old timers and sponsorship, you know, it helped me to understand the truth about myself, which allowed me to surrender to this thing even deeper uh, and, 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 and even more convicted than I ever have that I'm powerless over alcohol, that I am truly, truly alcoholic. And so, we'll, you know, we'll spend some time on this page 30 and, uh, and then I'll take us back over and let, let off uh, somewhere around 34, 33, 34. Um, before we're done, but, but, uh, you know, last week we talked about attitude and we talked about how important it is to have, you know, a rotten attitude and what that's cost us in life. And I made the statement that I, I, don't, I would, wouldn't want to really ever see how much my attitude has cost me. Um, it's cost me a lot. And, and for a lot of people, an attitude is what prevents them from ever getting sober. I mean, when we talked about that in the spiritual fitting set, we can only be defeated by a rotten attitude and, and belligerent denial. And then we're talking about, uh, you know, we're talking about an idea of a relationship with this power greater than ourself, of course. Uh, but that, but that brings us into this chapter that we're into tonight. And, and uh, if you look at that page 30, the, the first three words are all capitalized. Most of us, I mean, that's, that's just a bold statement right off the bat. Most of us uh, have been unwilling to admit we're real alcoholics. And no person thinks likes to think that he is bodily or mentally different from his fellows. And I think that's a fair statement. Nobody does. Therefore, it's not surprisingly that our drinking careers have been characterized by countless vain attempts to prove that we can drink like other people. And, and let's face it, the, most people will die trying to prove that in, in today's standards. The idea that somehow, someday, he will control and enjoy his drinking is the great obsession of every abnormal drinker. And the persistence of this illusion is astonishing. Many pursue it into the gates of insanity or death. Many, many go down that road. But I just want to go back to the very first, first sentence. Most of us have been willing to admit we were real alcoholics. So what is a real alcoholic? Someone would ask you that question. What is, what is a real alcoholic? And, and so we spent 60-something pages to this point 
trying to unpack that. What, what is a real alcoholic? But if you, if you want a definition, if you go back to page 21, we kind of get a definition for it in the, in the first full par paragraph. Um, there, there's one illustration of it and, um, and it starts with, but on page 21 it says, but what about the real alcoholic? He may start off as a moderate drinker. He may or not become a continuous hard drinker, but at some stage of his career, he begins to lose all control of his liquor consumption once he starts to drink. And so that terminology control, lose control, if you pay attention to that, you will find that verbiage used a lot to describe our relationship with King Alcohol. And so when you hear me say that, you know, that, you know, there was a time when there was a 20 question uh, test given to you, especially in treatment centers, and then they, they, they uh, narrowed it down, I think, to 12 questions. And, but really you could have just given me one question. And that one question is, Harold, can you guarantee what's going to happen when you start drinking? Um, and the answer is no, I can't guarantee what's going to happen. Why? Because of, of the loss of control. And I think one of the best definitions of alcoholism is, is at the bottom of the page in, in, the, in the third full paragraph on this page 30. We alcoholics are men and women who have lost the ability to control our drinking. And this, I can't guarantee what's going to happen when I start drinking. And, uh, and the fact that once I start drinking, I can't stop because it's in session, because this, this physical allergy, this phenomenon of craving that kicks in, I can't stop. And so that's the beautiful part about it here today, whether we're 30 years sober or three days sober or 30 days sober or three months sober, it doesn't matter. If we're on here today and we have a desire not to drink, I hope that you hang on to that as one of the most precious gifts that you ever have ever in your life, despite Christmas. Um, the gift of sobriety is a, is a tremendous piece of the grace pie, if you want to call it. Uh, it, it, it is a it's a tremendous blessing. And to not only have it, but then to recognize how valuable it is, how important it is, and how easy it can slip through your fingers through one word, and it's called compromise. Um, but that, that word really don't come into play until we're here and know the truth about ourselves. But, but knowing the truth about ourselves is the big dilemma of the alcoholic. It really is. It's it's what this is why most people pursue it to the gates of insanity or death. And it's not a word denial. So there's three words I want to look up and put some definition with. One is denial, one is illusion, one is delusion. And I think it's really important to get that because I think we throw the word denial around loosely. It came out of the treatment center world in the seventies and eighties, uh, became the buzzword, you know, and there was a lot of coffee cups that said I'm swimming in the river of denial, you know, or denial is not a river in Egypt and, and things like that. But, but the word denial, as far as our literature goes, it's only mentioned twice, once on page 10 and once in the spiritual appendix. And both times talking about denying a power greater than ourself. But when the book talks about the malady of the alcoholic, the, the illness of the alcoholic, it talks to us about it on the basis of illusion and delusion. I mean, I can't see myself for what I really am. And I can't differentiate the truth from the false. And friends, that's the dilemma of the alcoholic. And, and so the writers of the big book have spent a lot of time and they're going through the rest of this chapter trying to illustrate what that delusion looks like and give us many, many uh, comparisons to relate to, identify with, which hopefully you do. And, and even if you haven't, even if you, here we are all the way up to page 30, which is really more than that if you include all the the, the preface and the forwards and all the, the doctor's opinion and all that, all the Roman numerals. You know, we're, we're 60 pages into this. And now well, here we are, more about alcoholism. You know, we're going to talk some more about it because we know that most people aren't going to be convinced that they're really alcoholics at this point. And so, you know, so I want to lift up a couple of definitions. And these, I'm just using Webster's Dictionary for these definitions, but it's, I think it's important. So definition of denial. Let me pull that up here real quick. A refusal to admit the truth or reality of something. So in order to refuse to admit the truth must mean that I know the truth. And most alcoholics don't really know the truth about themselves. There's, there's an element that they're in trouble. I mean, there's definitely an element of denial in our illness, no question about it. There, you know, there's certain truths that you can't deny. I got blood on my shirt. You know, I got my tooth knocked out. I got a stitches in my head. You know, there's things like that. But when it comes down to the mind, which was Gary was lifting up, and the allergy of the body, that's where 
the the word delusion and illusion really come into play. So there is definitely an element of denial of alcoholism, but the, the way the book describes it is way past that. And again, it's on the basis of illusion and delusion. And really, really important to know that. So illusion, a misleading image presented to the vision. It's an optical illusion, something that deceives or misleads intellectually in our mind. You know, another definition is perception of something objectively existing in such a way as to cause misinterpretation of its actual nature. Uh, the book would just the book would use language like our alcoholic life seemed like the only normal one. That you know, this illusion that it's one way when it's really not. And uh, and then the, and then the challenge is, as someone who loves the unloving creature of an alcoholic, is that we try to convince others that they're the ones that are delusional and illusional. You don't know what's going on with me. You don't know what I have to go through. You don't know, you know, you don't know. I mean, this goes on and on and on and on. And then you have this word delusion. Um, and, and the definition of delusion is, and this is a psychological definition, this is a persistence and they're going to basically call it a mental illness, a false psychotic belief regarding the self or persons or objects outside the self that is maintained, maintained despite indisputable evidence to the contrary. So despite what all the stuff you're saying about me, despite what this, this sheriff has to say about me, despite what, you know, my ex-wife or my family or my parents or, or my girlfriend or whoever has to say about me, I'm just telling you it's not it's not that bad. It's not what they say this. It's it's just not. And it's that delusion that, that takes many of us to the gates of insanity or death. And if you've been in a treatment center, then you've been to the gates of insanity. Uh, because that's just another fancy word for it. Treatment treatment center is just a fancy definition. It's a more glorious term for being at the gates of insanity. Um, you know, if you've been in jail, locked up, um, those type of things, institutionalized in a psych ward a 48 hour hold or a 72 eight hour hold. I mean, due to this illness, I mean, you've already been to the gates of insanity. So the only thing left is death. And the reality of it is most people in today's times, uh, I mean, there's millions and millions and millions of alcoholics. We got a couple of three or 4 million, maybe tops in, in, in sobriety, but there's way more than that out there actively using. And, and there's, you know, it'd be 3.5 million people die from directly from alcoholism this year. And that's not counting the drunk driving accidents and the robbery's gone bad and the homicides and the suicides and you can go on and on and on. And so that's a huge number compared to how many people are sober. So the, the, the statistics prove that most people will go to the gates of insanity or death in today's times, despite all the information there is about recovery. You know, you gotta think about when they're writing this book, this is this solution is that we just got done talking about with Roland Hazard and Carl Young and this rich hazard family sending this guy to go live with the top psychiatrist in the world for a year. Think about how much that would cost today if you were going to go hang out with the most, you know, um, acclimated, uh, highlighted psychiatrist in today's modern culture. You're going to go spend a year with them. I mean, that would cost an ungodly amount of money. Um, and this is what happened to Roland. Despite all that time he spent, he spent a year with this guy. Despite all that time, he was still told that I don't think there's much hope for you. You know, and uh, he goes, you mean there's no hope at all? And he goes, well, on rare occasion, I've seen, you know, you know, a few people spiritually have a transformation. And that's what I've been trying to do with you all along. And I just haven't been able to do it. So, yeah, I don't I don't see that, you know, something's going to have to happen in that nature. So you, you see all the efforts that money and knowledge and power and glory, prestige, you know, thrown at this thing called this this problem of the mind and body, this alcoholism. And, and they still were drunk again. I mean, he got drunk on the way home after spending a year with his doctor. Something you think about. It. I mean, that's how powerful this delusion is. I can't see myself for what I really am. That what you say, what the evidence say, isn't true. And as we stay sober and throughout our life, I can promise you, as you start to discover character defects about yourself, whether it's money, sex, you know, it's going down the line intimacy. I mean, I can pick a thousand subjects. So you look at these other subjects, you will see how this, this deluded mind, this, this problem with delusion will impact every area of your life. And that's why we need sponsors more than we ever have in our life. Um, at 33 years of so sobriety, as much as I did at three days of sobriety, is that I need somebody who's not emotionally involved in my life, who can help me see myself for what I really am and see it for what it is because of this twisted perception 
it goes on between my ears, you know, and we've, we've lifted this point up, but I, I can't, it might sound like beating a dead horse, but it's really, really important, especially if you're new to know this truth about yourself. And so it goes on to say, we learned that we had to fully concede to our innermost selves that we were alcoholic. This is the first step in recovery. And here's the word, the delusion that we are like other people or presently maybe has to be smashed. You can just almost visualize everybody here with plastic on and Gallagher coming out with a big watermelon that says delusion on it, just smashing it right on the table and splattering on everybody. I mean, this, this, it has to be smashed. I mean, this, this idea that we're like other people and, uh, and because I get that today, doesn't mean I, I, I get it tomorrow if I don't stay here. You know what I'm saying? So a compromise can clearly dilute what I subscribe to be true today. I could lose that tomorrow and, and somehow another think that since I've been sober for 30 plus years that, and I'm smart now and I got degrees and, I'm, and I've got a family and I've got some money that, you know, I should be able, you would think that I should be able to just drink like other people. I mean, that that's a scary thought. I never had that thought, but I know it's real because I watched people who never had that thought all of a sudden had that thought and then they drank again and they burnt their life completely to the ground, just like the the, the man of 30 that we just lifted up, that Gary lifted up. I watched it happen. I watched it happen with one of my best friends who had 10 years of sobriety and his sponsor unfortunately made a pass at his wife and he got a huge resentment towards his sponsor and he drank again. I'm telling you within 90 days, it was all gone. His wife, his six-figure job, everything. Drank it all away in, in 90 days. And so I've seen, I can just sit there and tell stories like that all day long of what I witnessed with my own eyes. So I don't want that to be me, but this delusion, uh, really, really important. I, I do a workshop sometimes called the five big delusions of alcoholism. And because I believe this illness is just saturated with it. It's, it's, in, in, it's, it's grounded in it. Of a delusional it's like a third of my life that i live especially as i started to do my four-step inventory and i started to look at these things gary was looking at the fears the resentments and uh and as the book would say fancy to real they had the power to kill me well as i unpack these things i unpack these things about my life i realized how much fantasy i lived in there were people on my list like uncle bob and my sponsor would say why do you resent uncle bob because he didn't like me Oh, really? Did he tell you that to your face? No, he never told it to my face. Well, did somebody else tell you that he said that? No, no nobody ever said that. And uh, well, then how do you know? Well, I just know. Oh, you just know. And so when's the last time you talked to Uncle Bob? 30 years ago. You know, I haven't had nothing to do with him for 30 years. And, and I had a laundry list of people like that on my inventory that I just gave them the Heisman, to use a college football term, out of my life because of my perception of what they thought of me. You know, and it's and it's twisted perception cost me so much. This diluted mind has cost me so much. So last week we talked about attitude and what that's cost us. Well, this twisted perception of a mind, this diluted mind, oh my gosh, I wouldn't even want to begin to see. If you plugged the cord in and threw it up on a you know on my head and threw it up on a big screen for everybody to look at, I'd run out the room to see what this this diluted mind has cost me in my life. In sobriety. I'm not even talking about drinking, I'm talking about in sobriety of spiritually growing up in this place of the delusional mind uh, and deluded choices I made because I didn't run it by a sponsor. I didn't get wise counsel. I just thought I knew what was right and what the truth was. And I went with it and it cost me and it cost other people, unfortunately, along the way. Uh, that's just the, the, the reality of it. But when it comes to this thing called King alcohol, if you're really alcoholic, uh, if you're one of those real alcoholics that we just lifted up, this delusion like for other people, and it has to be smashed, friends. And so uh, if there's nothing else that you get out of this chapter, if there's nothing else that you get out of anything that Gary and I set up at this point, I hope that you get that, that you can see that to your innermost self. And there's no way that can do it for you. Nobody on this planet can do that for you. You have to be able to do that to yourself. It's a very, very personal thing to the very inner being of who you are that I am powerless. I'm so thankful that I didn't die before I was able to re take step one. And step one for me came, you know, in a jail cell once again, on my way back to prison once again. And as I was arrested in there, you know, I didn't, I didn't need a bailiff. I didn't need a lawyer. I didn't need anybody to come up and, and sit down and go, Harold, you know, you can't drink like other people anymore. You're going to spend the rest of your life incarcerated or you're going to die from this. And the game was up, you know, and I had enough clarity 
you know, just enough clarity to get past that delusion that I was like other people to go, I know, I know that's the truth. And, and, uh, and it gave me a little bit of willingness. I didn't come all the way in, sit all the way down, as Gary would say often, uh, but I, it opened the door. You know, it got me to the front porch and I was able to start to uh, listen and, and then slowly but surely step in this thing and, and, and have an amazing life afterwards. But, um, but it's just so true. And, and there's so many analogies that we could give, you know, to illustrate this, you know, the, the cucumber, the pickle, you can go on down, the, you know, the raw onion, the fried onion. You know, the live chicken, the fried chicken. I can go on now and give you a lot of illustrations to prove that if you're a fried chicken, you ain't never going back to be a regular chicken. Unless you're my buddy Bruce's chicken. My buddy Bruce, and God bless his role, he's no longer with us, but he was an old gunnery sergeant in the, in the Army in Vietnam and all that. And uh, he was an old hardcore AA, you know, and his wife, Ellen, and him, they bought a little place out in the country, and his wife was adamant on having chickens. He says, well, you're your chickens. I ain't messing with those chickens. I ain't taking care of those chickens. They're your chickens. And, and they had a couple of roosters that kept getting out. And every time Bruce would come home, these roosters would almost attack you. They'd come up and at least challenge you. And Bruce told him, <laughs> Bruce told him, he goes, you got this rooster? He goes, I'm, gonna, I'm only going to tell you one more time. If I come home and that rooster comes after me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break his neck. And uh, sure enough, it wasn't just days later, comes home, here comes that rooster out. And Bruce got all that rooster and twisted his neck and threw it over the fence into the field. And he said like two or three days later, he came back and that rooster was out there with his neck bent like this. He was still alive, you know? And, and so, so Bruce called him Lazarus and, uh, and he let him live after it. He goes, my God, he goes, but the rooster can survive all that, but he got to let him live. And so Lazarus lived on. And uh, so I guess you can almost be a fried chicken and uh, come back, but you can't be a fried chicken and make it back. And that's, that's the reality. It says that we know that no real alcoholic ever in italicis recovers control. Uh, all of us felt at times we were regaining control, but in, you know, intervals usually brief or inevitably followed by less control. And then which led to pitiful incomprehensible demoralization. And so that's just a really challenging place to be. And over any considerable time, we get worse, never bear. And Gary lifted it up well, the progressiveness of this. You know, it's like, the, you know, you've heard, probably heard it. If you haven't, you will. It, it's like the, the illness is doing push-ups while you're waiting. Um, and if you drink, you know, and I've just witnessed it with enough people. I don't need to be convinced personally. I, I've seen it happen to enough people to know that it's true. But I love all this because all these pages, all these paragraphs that Gary's lifted up, I've lifted up, Bill's written here and others and, here we are on page 31, and I love this paragraph. It's one of my favorite paragraphs in the book. First paragraph. Despite all we can say, 60-something pages into this thing, despite all we can say, many who are real alcoholics are not going to believe that they're in that class. <laughs> despite everything that we can say about it, right? By every form of self-deception experimentation, they will try to prove themselves exceptions to the rule, and therefore non-alcoholic and that my friends is a dilemma and if you're a get high freak on top of that and you're out there doing street things with it on top of it well you can take that that's like putting it on steroids and take it through the power of 10 you know it, you, you, it, that 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 battle with death is there every time you go out and, and engage and so it's just the it's just the reality and then you get this story and we're going to get one illustration after another they got fire managers. you got the man of 30 then you got jim's story and then you got the jaywalker you go bam 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 we're going to keep throwing these illustrations at us to make this point of you know the the the, the reality of, of drinking and uh we lifted up this up early 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 in, in this study together but over on page 33 it says young people may be encouraged by this man's experience to think that they can stop as he did on their own willpower we doubt if many of them can do it because none of them really want to stop and hardly one of them because of this peculiar mental twist. And there it is. Uh, has al they've already acquired, we'll, we'll find they cannot win out. And, uh, and in several of our crowd, men of 30 or less have been drinking only a few years, but then they find themselves as helpless as those who have been drinking 20 years. And I'm not going to read the page again, but if you, it, depending on what version of the book, but if you go back to the section of the story, it's called They Stopped in Time. The preface page for that, which does not have a page number, is the only page in the big book that's italicized from the beginning to the end. And it's, and it's, it's laying the groundwork for the 17 stories of young people in AA. 
And if you're young in AA, and I would just say, you know, 40 or less, um, and there's a lot of teenagers and people in their 20s in AA today. You know, we got young people in AA conferences all over the place, and, uh, and that's awesome. Uh, but there, but that's the dilemma of the young alcoholic is that I just, I haven't suffered all these things. So am I really an alcoholic? And so I could, you know, and I got sober young. I got sober at 22 years of age. I was 21 going on 22. Um, and so I can understand this dilemma for the young person, uh, especially after they get here, get sober and start to acquire worldly things. They got a family, they got a job, they got things and the pressures of life, the pressures of the job. Let's go to happy hour. Can you come to this party? We're having a Christmas party, a company Christmas party. And that pressure from people who are not alcoholics to say, you sure you don't want a beer? You sure you don't want a glass of wine? You sure you don't want something to drink? And if you're not fully conceited or you have this little bit of twisted perception that maybe, just maybe, I'm not, because maybe that was just a phase. Maybe that was just a bad season. Uh, and then you, you grab a hold of it you may or may not ever be able to put it down again. That's the, that's the ugly nature of this piece. So um, really, really important page that, that ties with that. And then the ladies, uh, really, really important page there at the bottom of 33. To, gravely, to be gravely afflicted, one does not necessarily have to drink a long time nor take the quantities some, have, some of us have. And this is particularly true of women. Potential female alcoholics often turn into the real thing and are gone beyond recall in just a few years. And so... You know, that's, I think, really something to lift up. And, and and so we lifted this up, but when you're talking about step one, I think it's so imperative to talk about it, is that, you know, if I had a whiteboard and I, you know, on here and I drew a line down the middle of the whiteboard on, on, on the heading on the left side, I put what alcohol did to me. On the right side, I wrote what alcohol did for me. And I handed you a marker and we all started answering the question of what alcohol did to us. We would have a long, long list of things that happened to us. And even... Everything I went through in my drinking, I could still look at that list and go, that didn't happen to me. I never did that. I never did that. You know, I could, I could easily cherry pick some things out of there that never happened to me. But on that other side of that page, where we write what alcohol did for us, uh, and we started to list those things, I think we would all be pretty much unanimous on that page. So, yeah, I, I had that, alcohol did that for me too. And that's what, I'm an alcoholic because not al what alcohol did to me. I'm an alcoholic because what alcohol does for me. And the fact that once I start drinking, I can't control what's going to happen. I can't control the amount I'm going to drink. And I really can't control what I'm going to do, say, or how I'm going to behave. And that's just a, and it could be an okay night, or it could be one that puts me behind bars for the rest of my life. It's that extreme with me personally. Uh, and so that's the nature of the beast as we look at. So the delusional mind, the delusions of alcoholism, really, really important, I think, to understand that as new people. The book does a real good job. Uh, laying that out for us and then they give us many many illustrations they gave us you know and, and you think about this man of 30 man he had to have willpower with a capital w man to go 25 years and not drink you know i'll just stop drinking and i mean that's amazing willpower but once he does he blows his life into the ground in four years i mean so we're going to see a lot of illustrations and we got one of the great illustrations uh coming up here with jim and so there's a lot of stuff to lift up in here but it's the main points that it's trying to drive home is that, you know, we've seen it all, friends. We've seen all, all the stuff on how we can overcome this thing. And if you're really powerless, um, you, you're not going to happen. Something deeper than this is going to happen. And we see that in the very first paragraph of, of We Agnostics. Um, it is Christmas time, so I want to stop there, but it is Christmas time. And I just want to, you know, lift up a short letter that's out there. You know, Bill wrote this letter during the holidays of 44. I think it's relevant to what we're talking about today. And some of you have probably seen this. You probably got a copy of it in your big book. You maybe got it on your refrigerator. Maybe you sent it out as a Christmas card even. But I just want to read a short little letter that Bill wrote uh, in the 10th anniversary. Greetings on our 10th Christmas in 1944. Uh, he sent this out to the entire body of AA members through, through the the, the uh, outlets that they had at that time. And this is what it says. So just listen to what this says and uh, think about it in context of what we read today and think about it in context of where we're at today at this COVID era that we're in. And uh, despite all the pandemic and all the fear and political divide and social unrest in, in our country, when you look inside the, the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, 
this is as true today, even though we're in a very turbulent time as it was in 1944. And let's just check this out. It says, greetings on our 10th Christmas, 1944. Yes, it's in the air. The spirit of Christmas once more warms the poor, distraught world. Over the whole globe, millions are looking forward to that one day when the strife can be forgotten, when it will be remembered that all human beings, even the least, are loved by God when men will hope for the coming of the Prince of Peace as they never hoped for before. But there is another world which is not poor, neither is it distraught. It is the world of Alcoholics Anonymous, where thousands dwell happily and secure. Secure because each of us in our own way knows a greater power who is in love, who is just, and who can be trusted. Nor can men and women of A ever forget that only through suffering did they find enough humility to enter the portals of the new world. How privileged we are to understand so well the divine paradox that strength rises from weakness, the humiliation goes before resurrection, that pain is not only the price but the very touchstone of spiritual rebirth. Knowing it is full worth and purpose, we can no longer fear adversity. We have found prosperity Excuse me, I lost my place there. We have, we have found prosperity where there was poverty. Peace and joy have sprung out of the very midst of chaos. Great indeed are blessings. And so Merry Christmas to all from the trustees, from Bobby, and from Lois, and from me, end quote. Well, that's a powerful letter, uh, you know, all the way back in 1944. And it was turbulent times then. You know what? It was turbulent times in 1934. And it was turbulent times in 1954 and 64 and 74. And here we are as 2020. And guess what? It's still turbulent times. We live in a chaotic world. But inside the fellowship is where we can find, you know, true hope, peace, you know, and joy and love. And, and, and I don't know of a place on the planet, friends, where it exists like it does here. And so if you're part of this fellowship, if you're part of this, you know, this spiritual family we call Alcoholics Anonymous, the al family group, whatever, if you're a part of that, um, it's a pretty special place to live and then it can allow you to uh, embrace the holidays with a smile um, with a real sense of gratitude and a real sense of joy but also with a real responsibility knowing that you have this this invitation into this family and there's lots of people out there that don't think they belong here or are disqualified from being here and friends we that's our purpose this holiday season is to reach our hand out and invite some of those people into this family so you, they can have the same experience you had and uh, help them overcome the delusions and all the things that they're fighting in their life. Um, we've been set free and uh, we have a great sense of uh, responsibility to pay it forward. So that's what I'm working on this year, this holiday season. I hope you are too. I want to pass it back to Gary. He's going to let us out. We'll, we'll share, have a few of us share with us for a little bit. Uh, we want to get out about 1.30. We want to finish because we got this whole uh, North Pole experience we're getting ready to have here with elves and Santa and Mrs. Claus and all that coming up. So we don't want to infringe on their time. Um, so if you can stick around for that later, I hope you do. And uh, and uh, especially this first elf that's speaking, because I sponsor this elf. You know, it's really difficult to sponsor an elf, I can promise you. But you'll, you'll enjoy this first one coming up. So that's all I got. Thank you. Gary, it's up to you, my friend. Merry Christmas. Thank you, Harold. Merry Christmas to you. Uh, any update on your daughter? Thank you for asking. Yeah, Danielle's fine. She went home. She was in Texas, friends. With uh, she had appendicitis. They uh, and they went in about a week and a half ago to the ER, and they immediately put her in ICU or not ICU. They put her into the hospital. They had to make room because of COVID overflow. They thought she had COVID. They put her on the COVID ward. They discovered a, another cyst. They discovered a cyst on her uh, ovary, and typically they grow on the outside. This was on the inside and was stretching the ovary. And that's what was causing all of her intense pain. They, they, she tested negative for COVID. So they got that out of the way. Um, she ended up checking herself and AMA herself out of the hospital because of the care she was getting. And they just didn't have the resources to do it. So she went home. But ultimately, she had to go back to the ER two days ago. And while she was in the ER, uh, what they discovered is that that cyst had exploded. You know, it, it just evaporated. And so her, she's not going to lose her ovary. That was the concern. They were going to have to surgically remove her ovaries. And that's not going to happen. The cyst went away. 
miraculously is gone and uh, she's fine. Everything's back to normal. Blood works good. And she's, uh, we're all happy in the long house. So thank you for asking. You bet. Right quick, folks, page 34. And this will kind of sum up, or what I'm going to do is sum up what uh, Harold was saying. For those who are unable to drink moderately, the question is how to stop altogether. Strong sentence here. We are assuming, of course, the reader desires to stop. Uh, I've shared with you a number of times, nobody nobody could give me that desire. In my case, the only thing that gave me the desire to stop was alcohol had to do it for me. Alcohol gave me a desire to not want to be with alcohol anymore. Uh, at the end of that paragraph, he says, yet we, this is the baffling feature of alcoholism as we know it, the first 100. This utter inability to leave it alone no matter how great the necessity or the wish. And there are many on this meeting and many of these rooms that we all know who have, we use words kind of throw away sometimes like retread. Uh, I'll even hear people say it just scares the hell out of me. Well, that last slip I had, I really needed that. Uh, so I could learn something else or something along those ways. You know, they told me when I got here, you don't ever have to take another drink again as long as you live, provided that you'll do a few certain things. And you don't have to go get drunk again. We never know when it's going to be the last time when finally the gates of death or insanity, and by the way, not all of us go to jail or prison or insane asylum, but that edge, that gate of insanity for me could be all those nights when the wife was in her bed and the children were in their room and I'm out in the garage with a bottle of whiskey wondering why in the hell I'm not with him. We could drive ourselves crazy drinking in the bathroom or drinking alone or waiting until the kids go to school or just isolating ourselves. How then shall we help our readers determine to their own satisfaction whether they are one of us or not? The experiment of quitting for a period of time will be helpful, but here's the sentence. We think we can render even greater service to alcoholic sufferers and perhaps to the medical fraternity. So we shall describe some of the mental states that precede a relapse into drinking. For obviously this is the crux of the problem. Insanity in AA means first drink. I go nuts and then I drink. I don't drink and then go crazy. When I start drinking, that's not insane stuff I do. That's drunkenness. The insanity happens before I take the first drink. And he's going to give some uh, illustrations here, and I'll do one of them very quickly and we'll stop. This is Jim. And we all know about Jim. But look at the paragraph at the bottom of the page. You know, he's already been to treatment. Uh, he gets in touch with uh, the people in AA, get in touch with him. We told him what we knew of alcoholism and the answer we found. He made a beginning. Big word there. That's what I did in 1988. I came in and made a beginning. And he began to work as a sales. Uh, he made a beginning. His family was reassembled. That was huge for me in 88. I wanted to get back right with my kids and my brother and, you know, just four months of not drinking. It looked to me and everybody else like my life was straightened out. You know, the way I say it to people today, in about four to six months of just not drinking, it'll look like 75% of my trouble is taken care of. 
four to six months, I can start sleeping again and get a little health back, might be able to work, keep a job and make a little money. And, you know, the family that loves us really wants to believe that something has happened. And so they're accepting that I made a beginning. But I never got in touch with that core said that 25%, that core spiritual illness that was already there before I started to drink. And it only got more acute over the years I had been drinking. To his consternation, he found himself drunk half a dozen times in rapid succession. Now, if you're on here and you found that to be the case for you, You've come in, you've gone out. You've come in, you've gone out. You've come in, you've gone out. Read the sentence just above that. All went well for a time, but he failed to enlarge his spiritual life. Over in Bill's story, we've been given this sentence already. The alcoholic who failed to enlarge their spiritual life through work and self-sacrifice for others. It's not enlarging my spiritual life by spending one hour a day in prayer. It's not enlarging my spiritual life to go back and join the church. It's not enlarging my spiritual life to do something for me Bill has already introduced the way I'm going to enlarge and perfect my spiritual life is through work and self-sacrifice for others. I'm brand new. I don't think I've got anything to offer anybody. I'm really not very interested in trying to help others. And thank God in my case for sponsorship that from the first week on gave me phone numbers of new people. And he'd say, I want you to call two of these folks tonight and just say hello and encourage them to come to the meeting. I didn't want to do that stuff. I was embarrassed to be calling a stranger. Be sitting with him at a meeting and he'd say, that guy looks new. You go meet him and bring him over here and sit with us. I didn't know that he had me enlarging and perfecting my spiritual life, but just getting out of myself for a few minutes. So I'm going to tell you a Christmas story, and I'm going to end with my first Christmas, December 1994. I've got a sponsor. I've been in one or two meetings every day. I've been doing the stuff for the most part that my sponsor is telling me to do. I'm making a little bit of money. Uh, my sponsor knew my brother, who's not an alcoholic. And he got me, a, my sponsor got me a job that the condition that he was my sponsor is I had to give my paycheck to my brother, uncash. And my brother would take my paycheck and start doing things like paying off all the local utility companies and the telephone company, and the two banks that I owed money to, and I couldn't have a bank account. And he'd take a little bit of my money and pay my bills and I had to have an allowance given to me by my brother with my money. And I kind of resented that. My sponsor said, you don't have to do it. Get another sponsor. If you're new here, there's no such thing as a dictator sponsor because we can fire them anytime we wanted to. But thank God there was just enough of me. I wanted, I liked something Jerry was doing. Well, my brother and I came up with an agreement of how much money, how much of my money, by the way, I could have to buy Christmas presents for each of my children. Well, I've been about four and a half months sober when Christmas comes up, and my children were not coming around. They were not telling me, we love you, and we're proud of you, and, you know, uh, they weren't calling me dad, and the birds weren't chirping, and the violins weren't playing, and I knew what I needed to do unconsciously is I needed to buy my kids back. So I went to my brother and I wanted more of my money, by the way, that we had agreed on and he wouldn't give it to me. I think it's called a resentment, but more than that, it was just nothing but total self pity. Well, Christmas Eve comes around. 
My brother's got a beautiful home. He's a beautiful man, beautiful family. I'm invited over that night to be a part of the Christmas and there's food and all that stuff. He wouldn't give me my money to do what I wanted, so to hell with him. I'm not going to go. And besides, I met a young lady in the meeting, and it was okay. I had four and a half months. She was at least a month out of treatment. And it seemed like yeah, I didn't go to my brother's. I think I had a TV dinner that night. I'll show them. And I kept waiting for that phone to ring, and she was going to call me. I kept waiting for that phone to ring and she was going to call me. And then the phone rang. And it was my daughter wishing me a Merry Christmas, you know. But I remember being on that call, man. I couldn't stay on it. This is way before call waiting because if I talked to her too long, I might miss my day. And about 8.30, I got a knock on the door. It was my brother. Huge trays of food and stuff from that dinner that he had brought over and said, we miss you being with us tonight. We thought you might want some of the meal. And I took it in, but I hurried him away because she's going to call. She didn't call. And at about 1030, the phone rang, thankfully. Well, it was another hairy-legged newcomer in a and they had a thing going on. They still do it in Odessa called an alpha top. And they start at noon on Christmas Eve and go to noon on Christmas Day and 